Thank you for having me. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, I thought what I'd do today is tell you a story that actually involves a collaboration along the lines of what we've heard about this morning. It's between my lab in chemistry and biochemistry and an engineering lab, in fact, in bioengineering. Um, these are the main characters in the story. These are the nanoparticles that we make in my lab. Um, this is one particular type of particle that we make. You can see them layered on top of each other in what is an electron micrograph. We use a high-powered electron gun to look at these because they're so small you can't use a normal optical microscope. I'll show you some optical microscope images of cells um, along the lines of what we just saw that are at a much different length scale, and I'll sort of try to compare them. Um, the first point of comparison is a human hair. This is actually a, the same kind of electron microscope was used to image a human hair in this case. Lying on top of it is a nanowire. This is a nanoscale wire. Um, our particles are about the same diameter as that wire. So that gives you an idea of how small uh, the particles are that we routinely make and then utilize um, in particular in nanomedicine applications. So this is where a particle will be delivered uh, one day to a human. We work in, in rodents now in my lab. And look at how particles distribute throughout the bloodstream, how they localize within tumors and within heart tissue. So we'll start with heart tissue for today's story. I'm not going to talk about cancer today. Now, heart disease is the largest killer of people um, all over the world who die from disease. Um, it's a little bit more people than cancer die of heart disease in general. Heart attack is one of the outcomes, of course, of having heart disease. So what's going on, this is a, a picture, actually, of a, a human heart, though we work in rats, and I'll show you images of rat hearts. Um, what happens, essentially, as many of you know, is a coronary artery is blocked. The muscle tissue at the end of that coronary artery um, fails to receive oxygen, oxygenated blood, and it stops working. Um, during the remodeling process, a big scar forms. And I'll show you some images of what those scars look like. The scar forms in the tissue um, and essentially fails to become a normal uh, muscle again. This is a particular problem when that occurs um, in the left ventricle, which is the location of the heart, the, the part of that muscle that's pumping the blood around your entire system. So the muscle will enlarge, and eventually you'll die from a subsequent heart attack. Um, what you'd love to do, or what Karen and I think you'd, you'd like to do, is be able to directly inject into that site some kind of a scaffold material, something to hold it together mechanically and potentially deliver a therapeutic to prevent the inflammation that's occurring. So that essentially you would deliver an anti-inflammatory to that location. However, if you inject directly into somebody's heart right after they've had a heart attack, you'll kill them, most likely. And the FDA won't approve um, that kind of behavior. <laughs> so what we looked at, what Karen and I thought was, well, if you could remotely inject, so in other words, intravenously inject a material that will circulate freely throughout the body, but when it gets to the heart, it'll actually localize and get trapped in that location. You will essentially have done sort of an assembly event of the scaffold by remote control. And for that, we wanted to use signals that are associated with the inflammatory response. And there's a whole set of enzymes that are upregulated by the tissue itself, by immune cells. And I'll show you an image of how those immune cells invade into this tissue and then how our particles follow and invade into the tissue. So that's really where we're up to now. The challenge being, how do you remotely inject something? And that's really where we came in, in terms of chemists wanting to do uh, something about a disease that kills almost all of us eventually. In the cartoon, is shown some of our little particles um, going through the bloodstream. This is how they look. They're about 20 nanometers across. This is an electron micrograph of those particles. This is a real high vacuum electron micrograph uh, that we capture at UCSD. Um, inside the tissue, they undergo an aggregation event and actually collect inside the extracellular matrix, the matrix that, that was holding the tissue together. And the goal is, of course, to then help heal the tissue. This is an electron micrograph of that kind of aggregation event. So the particles go from being little spheres to being very large millimeter scale objects that are actually sitting in the heart. In my lab, we spent a lot of time making these things and we spent a lot of time proving that we made them. They're very, very small. So you're not just running around obviously knowing that you've got the results you've gotten. So we spent a lot of time developing methodologies that allow us to actually visualize the particles to begin with. Now this is, a, this is an electron microscope. This is a high vacuum electron microscope image that I just showed except we don't inject particles into humans or into rats in this case in high vacuum. They're in liquids. And so at UCSD, together with people at a, uh, the Pacific Northwest, Northwest National Lab, we're developing a method. This is actually a liquid uh, TEM experiment. We're developing this in, in my lab. 
Um, this is one of the very first images ever of a nanoparticle like this moving around in solution. So we, for the first time, can actually see an object at high resolution. This is groundbreaking, by the way, even though it looks like a blurry old video. Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's not as good as that, but you're seeing motion for the first time. So this is part of the process by which we make these things, prove that they're moving freely in solution before we go into the animal. We study them in cells, so we prove that the particles can get into tissues. This is an example of where we've actually made a 3D rendered image using light microscopy. Our particles are in red, and vesicles and parts of the cell associated with the uptake process are labeled in green. So this is how we can prove our particles are both nanoscale objects, but also interact with the biological system. Um, we use another kind of method whereby we actually cut into the cells themselves using an iron beam. Um, iron beams are used to mill all kinds of nanoscale features in electronics, for example. We use exactly that same kind of beam to blow tissue apart and find our particles inside, actually embedded in the cells themselves. Um, this technique is done again at, in collaboration with the National Lab. Um, this is a tool that's um, never been used like this to image nanoparticles. It's always been used to image, say, natural things like meteorites. Um, so we use this tool to actually map out the cell. This is a SEM, this is an electron micrograph of a cancer cell in this case, with our particles stuck inside it. Um, so that's part of the process. We can also see inside the tissue itself by cutting it. This is a, uh, a piece of tissue. Um, in this case, this would be the heart tissue from a rat that we'd given a heart attack um, uh, artificially. We then slice the heart into 10 microns sli um, or, or, or thinner slices that we can then visualize by standard light microscopy methods and some more advanced techniques. So we take this little tissue slice like this. We look at it with a light microscope. And this is what one of the tissue slices would look like. This is a rat heart, but this is how your heart would look as well. So that's the whole tissue laid out for you. You can see healthy heart tissue looks nice and pink. This is a stained tissue, actually, where the red is the cell body, the muscle tissue itself. In white, what looks like white is actually where immune cells and the inflammatory response have started to invade the tissue. And the muscle's been pulling apart. It's actually separating apart. And you can see during the remodeling process, you end up with a big scar where you're, you used to have muscle. So our goal was, as I said, to do a, rem a remote injection into that location. So this is what's called an H&E stain. This is what a pathologist would see um, if he did an autopsy. Okay. In the next image, you'll see the same piece of tissue, but in a fluorescence, in a, in a fluorescence mode, where we see cells in green, and you'll see their nuclei in blue. So my student, Andrea, is going to zoom in on this location. This is a massive tile scan, so we can get high-res images of the tissue and overlay it on a low-res image so that you can see the whole heart. She's going to zoom back out from the healthy tissue, and she's going to go over to the scar. In blue are the immune cells that have invaded. In red are our particles, and you can see they've swarmed into that location. So these are injected intravenously, and they've now localized um, in this site. So we've achieved that first step of getting localized delivery. The next step is to load this thing with therapeutics. And so essentially, we would pack this thing full of anti-inflammatories that would otherwise kill you or be extremely toxic and deliver them specific to this location. So you can see we're going to zoom back out. You can see they got into this part, but not this part. So there's always room for optimization. Um, and that's where we are today. I'm going to leave you with this slide and, and just highlight that we make these things from scratch in the lab. Um, so we're chemists, as I said, and we synthesize these things. We know how to prepare them. We understand them down to the angstrom scale. So 10 times smaller than the nanoscale that I just described. Uh, we make them out of polymers. In this case, it's actually a, a drug uh, that's used to treat cancer. That's the other half of what my lab does. Um, but I just leave this with you now, and I'll, I think we'll be available for discussion about how we might actually be able to do this and how we actually physically go in and pack a particle like this with drug uh, for delivery. Thank you.